so, okay, you guys are jumping on now. I knew you'd show up for this. When I say let's talk about sex, I'm like, my folks are going to show up. It was weird. Nobody was showing up before. So the reason why I decided to do this live today, hey, Michelle, I'm glad you're here, is if you didn't see it yesterday, um, one of our members who is autistic, our, our, one of the women in our, in our group, had asked me to post a member a member asks post about she has a pretty low a lower sex drive and she was curious if this is common fairly common for other folks on the spectrum and so i put, posted that as a member asks post yesterday and we had some really good commentary some interesting um commentary between our neurotypical folks and our autistic folks and I want to just commend you guys. I want to say that I'm really proud of you guys. And I, I always tell you guys when I post topics, and we also had another post earlier in the week too about porn. And I'm also, I'm always telling you guys to keep it respectful. This group is, I, I insist that we keep the integrity high in this group because we have neurotypical folks in here. We have uh, autistic folks in here. We have, um, both genders who are on the spectrum. We have heterosexual folks, couples, homosexual couples. We have all people from all walks of life. And so it is really important to me to keep the integrity levels high and to keep it respectful so that we can all learn from each other. And I'm always so proud of all of you because you really do that and you really do show an interest in sharing your experiences in a really respectful way. And you really do listen to each other. And the, the things that you share uh, are really helpful. And sometimes you guys will, will private message me and share with me how really helpful it is what the others are saying. And what, so I want you all to know that when you do share your experiences here, I know you're being really vulnerable sometimes, but I want you to know that others are really listening to you and are really benefiting from what you're sharing. So this, that, and that is exactly what this is for. I'm actually in the process of putting together a step-by-step -step roadmap that, that explains this coaching process because so many of you come to me and say, how do I go through this program? And there really is a method to the madness in my brain. And, and it starts with education, which is why I have this coaching group. And then sharing is part of that. And then I'm, I really want you to move into the group coaching part of it, which is the communication uh, transformation program. And then eventually, some of you move on into private coaching with me. And I'm actually uh, throwing around in my brain a, another group coaching uh, program not, that's not just about the communication transformation, but also group coaching that's not just focused on the communication uh, program. And that would be for those of you who've already finished the communication program, but, but aren't either ready for private coaching or it's not affordable for you. So anyway, this back to this sharing piece is so important. So, but let's get to the, the sex part because I know that's why you're here. Um, hey, oh, hey, Janine, how are, you, how are you? Good to see you. All right. So yesterday, and I've got my, uh, my, the, the thread from yesterday pulled up here on my other monitor. So we had neurotypical folks and, and autistic folks talking about this yesterday. And, and I really want to highlight this whole issue of sexuality and how the, it, it, this whole, the communication, the communication uh, model that I have really applies to exactly what you guys were talking about yesterday. Because what happens is there are all these expectations that we have in the beginning of our relationship. We go in, we meet, and we, we, we start to develop this, 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 this relationship. And there's chemistry sometimes, and sometimes it's not as much. And we go into the relationship with these expectations, these goals, values, beliefs, and about being in a relationship, about what it's like to be uh, a woman in a relationship, a man in a relationship, a wife, a husband, and also about what sex is supposed to be. <clears throat> so we go into it, it uh, about with, with ideas about what we want and what we need 
um, what that's supposed to be like, you know, who's supposed to initiate, who we want, to, how often we want to have sex, what our preferences are, what our body actually desires, you know, our sex drive. Uh, that's sometimes, and there are different factors that influence all of that. Uh, whether we're male or female influences that. The age we are. Some of you are in your 20s and 30s. Some of you met your partner when you were in second marriages, and so you're in your 40s and 50s. So your age is going to influence your sex drive. Um, your, your cultural background is going to influence your values even about sex and you know, what's you know, what, what you think and feel about how you go about sex and what's okay. Like the, one of the, the, um, the, the threads this week was about pornography and we all have these, these ideas and about what's okay. And we, we have values. Um, so all, even our own self-esteem, how we feel about ourself, our body image, you know, are we comfortable with our body? Are we comfortable, you know, are we the, are we somebody who wants the light on or the light off? Are we okay with, with being naked in front of our partner? You know, or is, is sex in the shower something we we're interested in or is that, uh, that's my personal space. And, and so in a word about personal space, this is, this is something that we also bring to it as unique individuals, we bring our own, just in who we are, we, we bring our uh, personal preferences in terms of our sensory needs. So we, when we talk about sexuality, we have to talk about our sensory needs because uh, individuals on the spectrum and even those of us not on the spectrum have different types of sensory needs and sensory challenges and sensory differences. So um Folks on the spectrum tend to have um, higher, really high or really low thresholds for sensation. So they're going to be really sensitive to certain sensations or really undersensitive. So what that means is they may be very highly sensitive to something like smell. And so let's just face it, you guys, the, there are lots of smells that are associated with sex. I mean, there's their body smells and we have our scents. And, and there are body odors, but there are also shampoos and soaps. And um, the, the, the man that I was with for two and a half years, you know, you guys, most of you know, I, I was married to someone on the spectrum. Both, both of these men were undiagnosed um, and, didn't, and were both pretty much in denial about being on the spectrum. Um, I didn't know about my husband at the time. I did realize that my, the man I dated for almost, well, two and a half years, I did realize he was on the spectrum, but he didn't really want to go there. But he absolutely was. And uh, he had highly sensitive sense of smell and taste. He could actually ch tell if I changed toothpaste brands. I, I remember I kissed him one time and he, he said, oh, you changed toothpaste. And I was like, wow, he, he could even tell. But he was also very sensitive to whether I... I had just brushed my teeth and he really, he, he had this strong reaction one time when I had just brushed my teeth and he was like, Oh, your mouth is so cold. And it, he said, do you brush your teeth with cold water? And I was like, yeah, who doesn't everybody? And, and he's like, no, I use warm water. And I thought, Oh, that's so gross. It, but you know, it never occurred to me. Um, hi Maddie. Good to see you. And so these are the types of things that we're so uniquely different, but may have never, we don't, we're not even aware that we have these differences. And so he was very sensitive to, to that, that he didn't really like to kiss because he was so sensitive to those different sensations, the taste, the, the temperature. And, and so kissing to me was very, something I really enjoyed, but he really did not. Um, and of course, because he was so sensitive, I was very paranoid about my breath and what I had eaten. And so it, that then contributed to me being insecure about it. And so these are the things that we bring to, the, that we're bringing to it. All of, all of this is related. 
And if you're not really super aware of it and able to talk about it and communicate about it, it can just lead to, to these insecurities and then you can feel criticized and rejected. And so it's so important to be able to, to, to learn how to talk about it. And most couples do not know how to have these conversations in the beginning of their relationship and well down the road in their relationship. And I'm going to talk about how that then contributes to where you, a lot of you guys are 20, 10, 8, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So, so you've got smells, you've got, uh, 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 a taste is what I mentioned, but then you've also got personal space. So folks on the spectrum oftentimes really feel uncomfortable when someone's really close into their personal space. Um, it, they, they really need to have distance and they feel very crowded when someone's in their personal space. So when you have sex, you've got to get into someone's personal space. And so this then gets into, okay, positions. So a lot of folks on the spectrum are a lot more comfortable with positions where there's no eye contact, where, you know, maybe doggy style or some other position where I'm not having to look at you, I feel more safe. But a neurotypical partner oftentimes feel very disconnected where that feels, and, and, a, and a, a neurotypical partner, like a, a female, a woman can feel objectified, but yet that position can feel a lot safer to someone with autism because that's you're not as much in my personal space. I can still feel close to you, but you're not in my personal space, so I feel safer. Again, this can lead to major miscommunication if, if when you don't understand what's happening here. All right, I see you guys saying hello. Um, and uh oh, my screen is there. We go. Um, Nathan said, I, I'm very affectionate and I had to learn to be more reserved. So you were kind of like over the top affectionate and had to learn how to, to not be so touchy feely and, and, uh, had to, to sort of back off a little bit. Um, and you're also saying foreplay can be really hard to discuss, especially since I have processing issues and cannot visualize things easily. My visual memory is terrible unless I can match it up to something. Okay, and so this is where, and, and I want you guys to be open-minded with me, and some of you may disagree with me, but what Nathan just said, this is where I have seen using some kinds of, of um, pornography can be helpful for couples. And I'm, t I'm not talking about hardcore porn, which is violent, but there is there are some sites out there where other couples are sharing their own sexual experiences and I've seen couples use it together, not as not when pornography is used as a substitute for sex, but where it's used where a, a partner can say, OK, I found a video which demonstrates something that I would like. And so it really is helpful as a as a teachable as a, as a teachable experience, because like Nathan said, some folks ha have a hard time understanding how to picture, how to under how to perceive what a partner is is trying to communicate in terms of this is what I'd like for you to do to me, and so that's that's that can be used as as a teachable moment. So this goes back to what we're bringing to it. We're bringing our abilities, and so our abilities to visually understand what you're trying to explain to me and our even our ability to articulate and communicate what I like. So not only is Nathan saying, I can't quite visualize what, what you're describing to me, but neurotypical partners or even autistic partners, we're also, you know, our ability to communicate to our partner what we like. And also our ability to really understand and know our own bodies and what we like is also what we're bringing to the bedroom, to our, not just the bedroom, wherever you're going to have sex. All of this, you guys, 
in, in, our, in my communication transformation program. Stage one of communication is about what we bring to our communications. And so communicating about sex is where it begins. That's where our sex life begins is what we bring to our sexuality, to our sex experiences. So a lot of you in the thread yesterday talked about how in the beginning it was great. It was great. Okay. So what happens in, in some relationships is in the beginning, um, there's this chemistry, there's this connection, there's, there's physical sex that, that's, uh, uh, there's a lot of physical, re- re- and, and some of you who were saying in the beginning, it was great. There's this connection. There's, um, there's a lot happening there physically, but one of you actually, I can't remember who it was, was saying, um, I realized that, that my, my husband was actually, I think maybe it was you, Michelle, um, was actually uncomfortable with some, some of what was happening or, um, it might not have been you, but some of that greatness is also part of our own perception of greatness. And in the stages of communication, we have what we're bringing to it, and then we have how we actually interact. So there can be the the actual acts of sex, which is how we actually go through with our sex, sexual experiences. And then let me fast forward a little bit for a moment to stage three, which is the meaning we take away from it. So in all of our interactions, we have stage one, which is what we bring to it. This applies to sex. Stage two is how we actually interact. So when applied to sex, it's how we actually, how we're having sex. Okay. Stage three is the meaning we, the takeaway. Was that a good experience? Was that pleasant? Did I enjoy that? Now for all relationships in the beginning, in the dating, the courtship, we're usually in that oftentimes we're looking for validation, confirmation that the the relationship is good. We're, we're in more of an infatuated dating courtship state. And so we actually are more likely to positively perceive it as a good experience. And we haven't had an opportunity yet to have more negative experiences in our relationship. So we are going to more likely perceive those experiences as pretty good and the meanings that the meaning that we're taking away from it is going to be m- more positive. The other thing that we're more likely to do in the beginning is to project onto our partner what we are wanting to perceive. And we're, we're if we are perceiving it as a pretty good experience, we're more likely to project onto our partner that they're having a good experience. And we may not actually see that our partner is not experiencing it as positively as we are because we're wanting it to be a really great experience. And it may, and I'm not saying that you guys didn't have great experiences. I'm just saying we're more likely to see what we expect to see because we're bringing those expectations. We're more likely to be influenced by what our expectations are. And then stage four of communication is what we recall or what we remember. So over time, our memory of how things happened actually starts to get skewed and we, that can either go one of two ways. So over time, our relationship history, how our relationship develops starts to change how we remember those early experiences and also how the meaning or the meaning, how we actually um, evaluate our sexual experience with our partner starts to change. We start to evaluate it as meaning more and more rejection over time because of the, the daily and the quality of our relationship is part of what we're bringing to it over time. If our, the quality of our relationship starts to deteriorate, then we bring that meaning to our sex life. We start to, we start to evaluate our sex life with this meaning associated to it. We feel rejected. We start to, um, associate this, this meaning that is more of a negative association. 
And then we start to remember our experiences more with a negative um, association. And we may remember back to the beginning as, oh, that was really great. But then more recently, it's been really bad. So all of these stages influence our sex life until we figure out how to really communicate in a way that is that is functional and healthy in our actual relationship all the time and in our sex life. Okay, I've got some comments over here. Chad says, I too am very affectionate, not so much touchy-feely, but more verbally and wasn't so comfortable for Katie. Um, <coughs> right, so we have to uh, we have to learn how to to communicate in a way that we're getting feedback from our partner. This is this is what we learn to do with reflexive listening. So uh, we learn how to listen to our partner, not just not just communicate at them. So Nathan, you and Chad are, are both on the spectrum, and and you're both saying, you know, I, I was I was doing this. I was being affectionate toward my partner, and I and and I had to learn how to you know back off a little bit. So we have to learn how to ask our partner what they're needing, what they're feeling, and then listen to their response and listen and hear. And that's part of reflective listening. That's part of stage two of communication, which is super important in our sex lives to be able to listen and hear what our partner is trying to communicate to us. Um, Tracy, I think my sensory stuff got worse after having my pregnancies, particularly after my third pregnancy. Is that possible? I feel like smells and textures have gotten harder for me to deal with, like his mustache stubble or too much poking on my lips. Some smacking, kissing sounds got me, get me to. Um, I wonder if cutting out a sense or filtering it could help, um, maybe with some noise canceling plugs. Uh, you know, I think pregnancy can actually absolutely affect women's bodies. Absolutely. Um, there are so many things that are that, that go on hormonally for women. So and hormones can most definitely affect um, how our bodies uh, experience and, and, and are, are com interacting with the environment. And so there's, I mean, it, hormones change the way our hair grows. So if I don't have any doubt whatsoever that hormones can change your sensitivity and the way your brain is, is interpreting sensory information. So if you experienced it, then believe it, that it, it did. And so to answer your question, if there's a way to um, filter out some of the other uh, sensations. So yeah, um, the smacking sounds. So if there's a way to, you maybe have music, like soft music playing in the background that's pleasant to you. You know, you and I have been talking about music all day long today in the, in the Facebook group. Um, if there's a way to, to filter out some of those sounds, um, and if the, the mustache stubble is difficult for you, then if there's a way to, to communicate to him that that's uncomfortable, if there's a, um, you know, if, if there's a way that he can groom his mustache that is more comfortable to you, then communicate that to him, you know, a certain length that's better for you, then, then try to figure that out. Um, the, the noise canceling plugs. Yeah. If there's something that's, that that's workable, absolutely. See if you can, and that, and instead of, you know, don't approach it from, you know, Oh, this is kind of, you know, it's not very sexy. Hey, don't think of it that way. Think of it as, Hey, if I can figure out something that actually makes it work so that whatever this sensory thing that's really interfering with me being able to connect with you, if I can fix that and then I can connect with you, do it. Absolutely. Uh, Rebecca says, um, my husband is very uncomfortable talking about anything like sex or intimacy. As things are currently, I'm having to consider if that is something I may have to live without if I stay in this marriage. So, okay, Rebecca. Um, so, my question on that is sometimes it, it, talking about sex can be, you know, it can feel private and it can feel uncomfortable. And sometimes it's also about the, the I don't know about anything. Y'all, sorry, my nose always itches when I do these lives. I don't know what it is, but um, 
sometimes it's un just uncomfortable in general because it's just such a private thing. And sometimes it has to do with the quality of the relationship and, and just because communication in and of itself is something that's difficult for a couple that couples just haven't learned how to communicate in general. And so I don't know where you two are in that. So if communication in general is difficult, it may be a very vulnerable, unsafe territory for your husband to, to enter into. He is, pe people don't like to talk about sex if they feel unsafe. Sex is one of those uh, topics that we need to feel extremely safe when we talk about it and because, you know, we just need to be able to be vulnerable in order to be able to have a safe conversation. So if there's any chance whatsoever that your husband feels like he, he, it, that there's a, there's a, a risk of feeling criticized or, and I'm not saying you're a critical person. I'm just saying that if he is concerned about that or, or risk of being judged, or if, it's just something, it may even be a topic that he's very, he feels very uneducated about, um, or he, he may feel um, that he doesn't know much about it, and so he doesn't know how to talk about it. Um, so it's, it's also something that um, I, I've encouraged couples to, to maybe start the conversation in writing. Sometimes having that conversation in person is also, is, can be hard. So having that conversation through text or email can feel better because a lot of folks on the spectrum need to be able to process what you're saying because in the moment, it's harder to, to know what to say right then. And so it's like, I, I, I need to process this. So that's also another tip. If, if he's willing to have the conversation, but maybe do it uh, not in a face-to-face -face conversation. And if any of the, uh, the rest of you here can relate to that, please speak up. Hi, Rianne. Good to see you. Um, sorry you didn't get a notification. That stinks. Um, Michelle says sometimes you'll choose music based on a wild and crazy or soft and slow. So, yeah, based on your mood. Yeah, that's a great, great idea. Um, Chad says first, ADHD considered on the, the spectrum – um, I'm not entirely sure. And second, I have a very high sex drive and a powerful hunger and desire for it. Um, but there are many drawbacks to it. Um, well, there don't have to be drawbacks to having a, a, a high sex drive and a, and a powerful hunger and desire for it. That doesn't have to be a drawback. The key is being able to communicate about it and to be able to talk openly and clearly about it and to be able to be respectful of your partner. And if this is something that you, you, you know, you, I know you and your Katie, you, you're still kind of figuring out that relationship and figuring out where that is and what that is. Um, it's something that you have to, we, for all of us, what our sex drive is, is just who we are. And it's important that we embrace that. We embrace that part of ourselves but, but we have to be respectful of what our partner is. And if our partner has a high sex drive, okay. If our partner has a low sex drive, okay. That's who they are. We have to be respectful of who our partner is. And, and we cannot try to make our partner who they're not. And so, and this is something that came up in the other thread we have to understand that it's not a personal rejection when our partner is not like us. Okay? This is important, you guys. If your partner has a low sex drive and you have a high sex drive, and I'm not just talking to you, Chad. I'm talking to some of the neurotypical women here, too. If you have a high sex drive and your partner has a low, lower interest in sex, that is not a personal rejection. That just means that your partner is not as driven sexually as you are. That's just personal. 
it's, it's, and even though sex is a way to connect, there are other ways to connect too. And I know for a lot of you, that sometimes feels like the only way to connect, but it's important to, to, to start learning how are some of those other ways to connect. And we really can't, um, guilt and shame our partners for not connecting with us in the way that we want to connect. Cause if that's not how they connect, it's just not, it's like, you know, if, if I like Mexican and you don't, I can't say, well, you're personally rejecting me because you don't like Mexican. Sex is just one of those things. Some people just hormonally are not driven. The, the, the woman who, um, originally wanted me to post this in the group. She said, you know, she's autistic and she just doesn't have a, she isn't, she's not that interested in sex. She can go weeks without it. And there are a lot of women who, and men too, men have low testosterone sometimes. And they're just, they don't have, they don't have a, a huge sex drive. It is, it's who we are. And we, we have to communicate and meet each other where we are and be who we are and not then look at our partner and say, well, because you aren't more like me, you are personally rejecting me. That is not a healthy way to be. And, and you're doing yourself, you're robbing yourself when you, when you approach it that way, you're robbing yourself of, of your own worth. When you, when you, when you, look at your partner and say, you don't, you're rejecting me. You don't care about me because you don't care about this as much as I do. You're robbing yourself of your own worth. Now, when it comes to sex, again, it goes back to, to learning how to communicate about it because sometimes you both do actually value it, but you've, you're into the, you're in such a, 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 a an antagonistic dynamic in your relationship, you don't even know how to have a conversation about it. And let me just say something, guys. So many of you are in antagonistic relationships. You're not on the same team. And it's, it's, it's darn near possible. It's, 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 it's so impossible. It's so difficult to have a healthy sex life when your relationship is antagonistic. Having sex is, is vulnerable and you give your body to someone else. It's hard to do that when that someone else is your opponent. Right? So when I, when I work with my private coaching folks, we don't, we don't even, we don't work on sex. Not until the very end, if at all. We work on the quality of your relationship and then sex naturally and organically starts to happen because, because my, my clients start to learn how to communicate and their, the quality of their relationship improves and then their sex life improves. All right. Nathan says, my wife says, Scratchy. I think you're talking about your face. Rianne says, I'm a lesbian, which I find it is common in autism. Also with a diagnosis of um, vaginismus as well, which makes um, sense to sensitive areas. Um, heightened sensitivity is an issue with me, unfortunately, uh, even though I'm open about everything to partners and close friends that know what I go through. I'm hoping to find the right person in my life who will totally understand that. Yeah. And so there again, you know, we're talking about, um, sensitivities and again, it just comes down to, um, and, and Rianne, you missed the beginning, I think. And I was talking about, um, what we bring, what we bring to our relationships. And so you're, you're bringing this heightened sensitivity and that's, that is so important that we're able to communicate about these things up front. Something that came up in the other thread was, uh, some of the, the, partners were feeling like that autistic folks were lying and being dishonest about their sexuality before getting into to relationships. And 
Um, my thoughts on that are twofold. One, it's important that when, when we're entering into a relationship with someone that we're honest about, well, first of all, it's a conversation to have when you're getting into a relationship with someone, not the first date, not the very beginning, but if you're getting to a point where you're, where you're developing a serious relationship and you're looking at dating long-term and you're getting to a point of being in, you know, committed relationship, you know, at some point you're going to talk about sex and sexuality. And especially if you have, you know, if you haven't started having a sex life yet, or if you're talking, if you're, if you're in a relationship where you're not going to have sex until marriage, um, you absolutely have to talk about it before you get married. You have to talk. You do need to talk about these things. It's, it's as important as talking about whether or not you want to have kids or, or what you want your careers to look like. You have to talk about sex. You have to. And I hold those of you accountable who got married without having that conversation. And, and I'm not guilting you. I'm not shaming you. I'm just saying that you have to look in the mirror. I've had to look in the mirror at myself with my own decisions about things and say, yep, that was me. That was on me. I didn't do that. And I did, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't figure that out enough. Um, we can't blame our partners for not providing us with information that we really should have made sure we knew. And we, we just can't, you know, and, and if, if somebody just flat out lied to us, if you had a conversation and they just lied, that's one thing. But the other thing is some of you were saying that your partner's masked for 15 years, 20 years. And that's just, that's, that's not, that's not likely that I don't, I don't think that that's happening. What typically happens is we change life changes. Um, how was it? Tracy, somebody was saying here, um, that after having three kids, her, her sensitivities change, our sex drive changes, our body changes. Our experiences change. Our relationship quality changes. Um, I was talking about those stages. So our, our meaning that we assign to our interactions with each other changes. Our sense of connection changes. Our, our memory of our interaction changes. What we're bringing to our interactions based on our old interactions and all the ones we've had before changes. So all of that changes and influences how we feel about having sex with our partner. And who we are today, 15, 20 years down the road, is not who we were 15, 20 years ago. So how we feel about having sex with you is really different than how we felt about having sex with you 15 or 20 years ago. So it's not necessarily that the mask is off. It's that we're a different person now. My body's different my memories are different. My experience is different. My, all, everything's different. We're different people. Um, let's see. Hey, Jen, good to see you, girl. Um, Tracy, you said, I like that you, you uh, said low testosterone and hormone changes because that means this isn't something people are choosing necessarily, but more of a body chemistry changing in, in throughout life, not a rejection. It's all of it. All of it. All of these are factors. Now, rejection, some of it can be a choosing. It's all of it. There are so many layers. So the relationship quality is a piece of it. So we may have a partner and we may be the one choosing at times based on our relationship. So, so basically if, if I'm in a, a relationship with somebody and, and he's being, you know, just really snippy, grumpy, irritable, nasty, rude, mean, I'm not feeling too romantic right now. So I'm choosing not, you know, and he, and he comes waltzing in like, Hey baby, you know, I'm like, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> that is me choosing. I'm not in the mood. Yes. That's not doing it for me. So, but at the same time, you know, my hormones may be fluctuating as I go, I'm almost 50. Yes, I am almost 50. I'm 48 years old. You know, my hormones are going through a lot of changes. So, uh, you know, my, my sex drive may be changing too. So there may be days that I'm hot to trot and days that I'm not. Same for men. 
It's all a factor and we, we have to look at all of it and we have to communicate. And guys, there are definitely days that women's bodies just aren't going to perform. And ladies, there are days that men's bodies just aren't going to show up. And it's not because he doesn't feel attracted to you. It's because his testosterone is low. And, and his tos- testosterone, by the way, is highest in the morning, especially after he ages. It really is highest in the morning. And by the evening, men, men that are in their 40s and 50s, it's tougher for them in the evenings. That's really legit if that's what he's telling you. And men, sometimes she's just not gonna. It's just, she's tired and she's sick and she's been with the kids all day. She may be willing to have sex with you because she wants to, to be with you, but she may not have an orgasm. It's just, but that doesn't mean she doesn't, she's not in, in it. This is our bodies, guys. We do get older. It happens. Um, okay. Michelle says making love has always been good for us. Um, I now think it's because I was so open about talking about it with him. What I needed, however, since we have gotten a diagnosis and started this journey, it has gotten more uh, vulnerable for both of us. And so, yeah, so that vulnerability, that's that's truly where connection is, is the vulnerability. That's That's true intimacy. Intimacy is in vulnerability. And we need safety to be vulnerable. All right, guys, I'm going to have to wrap it up here soon. But let's see, Chad, you said, um, I don't want to have hardcore sex. I want to make love to Katie. But getting to that point with her is seeming very long. Not that I don't mind waiting. Um, I'm just afraid that she may take longer to tell me when she's ready to a point that I may never know when she's ready for it. That's why you keep the communication open. And and you don't just wait. I mean, and you don't want to just keep asking her, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? But what you do is you continue to build the friendship. The friendship is where that the friendship is, is, is so important in a relationship. You continue to build that, but also a, a, an intimacy, which is beyond a friendship. An intimacy is where you share your innermost, uh, you, you share more than, than friendship. You share, um, affection, kissing and holding and, and other type of affectionate touch. And, and then you check in with her more and more and ask her, you know, what level of, of physicality she wants. You ask her what she wants, what's her preference, you know, what are her values about that? What does she prefer? And, and that's some, sometimes folks with autism think about having that conversation once and then that's it. One time conversation. And then I'll have my answer, but no nerds. And, and Katie, I can't remember if you said she may be on the spectrum too. Um, but typically it's important to have that conversation, have check-ins periodically and say, you know, where are we now? You know, um, we'll just check it in. And you know, how, how, what do I know? And maybe not every day, <laughs> not every day. Um, but you know, every month or so, every couple of weeks, um, and, and just based on, on you know, any changes that you may notice in how she responds to you. Jen says, I think that it's also important to note that life can in fact change from what you talked about in the beginning. Absolutely. You are in fact growing together and experiencing new things together and uh, thoughts and opinions change due to life experiences. Absolutely. That is so true. And so that changes what we're bringing to it. That's true. So we cannot hold our partners accountable now for what they were bringing to it 10 years ago. We can't say, well, you said when you were 25 that, that you wanted to have sex three days a week. And now, you know, we're 50 and you only want to have sex twice a week, you know, or tw- uh once, whatever, you know what I'm saying? We, we can't do that. Come on, guys. Um, Michelle Soups, I meant noticed, not needed, but I, it can be scary to give yourself to another person you love so much. Um, yes, vulnerability. It, it's, it's vulnerability, though, is where it's at. That's vulnerability is the foundation of intimacy. And this is, this is where um, a, a truly good sex life is born, is vulnerability 
equals intimacy and that this is where you know sex good sex is not just about physical the physical so all right you guys i'm gonna have to call it a night thanks for showing up and talking to me here um as always um you guys are, are awesome and i knew you would be um if you uh Oh, Taylor. Hey, Taylor, you just you have another question. How do you know if your partner is being vulnerable with you? Well, um, I think your partner, you, when your partner is being vulnerable, your, your partner sharing some pretty um, personal information and some pretty personal details, uh, some, some personal experience. And um, yeah, when your partner is being vulnerable, it's your, your partner's getting personal. And it, it, it feels raw. You're welcome, Chad. Good to see you here. All right, you guys, you have a great evening. I'm actually signing off for the weekend and I will be, on, I'm, I'm not seeing, co I'm not seeing my coaching clients. I'm off for Thanksgiving next week, but I will still be doing my Tuesday live at five. So I'll still see you guys there and I'll be, uh, in, in the group next week. So, um, okay, Rianne, good deal. Watch, watch the replay if you guys didn't catch the whole thing. Hope you guys have a great weekend. And um, maybe some of you guys will get lucky this weekend. I don't know. But it starts with communication. And seriously, you guys, if you haven't done the communication course, it will absolutely improve your sex life. So, the prep course is ready for you, and we're going to be cranking up another coaching group in January. Enrollment's opening up in December. I highly recommend that you do the prep course first. So if you don't know how to find that, go to my website, spectrumrelationships.com, and it's right there on the self-study tab. All right. I'm going to sign off, you guys. I'll see you later. Bye.